over the summer, earlier in the summer, we were talking about the images that you use and your relationship to the images over the past few years uh -huh. and how they function within your work and how you think of them in relationship to narrative and to time. And that got us talking about film. Yeah. And I wanted to like start there, like going into the set of images that you put together in the show. Because I know you think of each painting within the context of like right. a bigger group. Right. And also how how you've been reflecting lately on how that relates to film as opposed to thinking of different histories of painting. Right. Um I've been becoming much more conscious of the whole cinematic aspect uh, of what I do. I mean, film and movies were, uh, when my wife and I first moved to New York, there were these great film festivals at the uh, Film Forum. And, and I remember seeing a Tarkovsky film, fest uh, film festival, Fassbinder, uh, Pasolini, and we just went to movies a lot. Like film doesn't seem to be as important culturally as, well, since, definitely since the 70s, but this was still the 80s, early 90s, so there was this carryover. And so I think film was just something like the way literature used to be and probably still is. Uh, film was just this basic education for, for me. And I think it's just, when I became a painter, I remember I realized it's important to just look at painting, just kind of a retinally educate myself, just, just kind of absorb it without thinking about it, but just visually just swallow it up. And I think film was like that for me as well. Um, I'm trying to remember when Tarkovsky became so important to me because it certainly wasn't in Russia. Uh, I didn't see that many of his. He was sort of not, it was very hard to see his movies. Um, so later Tarkovsky became someone that I was thinking a lot about. And I would listen to his soundtracks while I was designing a body of work, like just looking at images. And I was working with photographs and we can talk about why I chose to work with photographs at some point. But, and I was working at the time with this, when originally I started working with this, with this, um, um, an object of a family photograph as a kind of a fetishistic object, which has a lot of aura, the way the kind of a painting I wanted to make had, had a lot of aura and a lot of history, and, you know. But I quickly realized, I remember I was painting, I was making this little Sumian drawing uh, of, of my grandmother in this garden. And it was almost like this annunciation scene. She's like pregnant with my father. The body work was called Pictures of My Father. And um, I quickly realized that I was looking through the photograph rather than at the photograph, slowly expanding it as if it was a movie scene. Like part of it was the necessities of making a, 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 a believable painting. I realized that the photograph was actually quite flat. And I started pushing the space back. I sort of entered into the frame of photograph and just started going, ooh. And then sort of having these weird and funny fantasies. Oh, it's like grandma in last uh, year in Marinbad. Like I remember like, like, like thinking, oh, it's like, you know. Besides the disannunciation scene, it's also, you know, last year in Marinbad. Like, it's actually a movie scene. Not just a still, a scene. And I was already aware of that. Like, that's what I'm doing here. Um, when was that? Actually? That was 92, I want to say. Um, I, was, I, I, I quickly realized that I was not interested in the photograph as much as a, a projected image the way a movie is projected on the screen. That is something that I wanted my painting to physically function much closer to 
than it resembling a photograph, even though I was using photograph and even engaging, obviously with the dialogue, with an object of a photograph. Um, so it and and then as 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 um, it progressed, so uh, you, you know it 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 the way I was thinking about it at the time is that the images and the paintings needed each other, each other's company to establish a kind of a world within which every one of them would be almost physically possible. And later that became almost like scenes from a movie. Like I was realizing I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I mean, uh, I think I said it. I mean, Richter said, oh, this is my way of making a photograph. And I didn't quite say it to myself, but in a sense it was, oh, this is my, my way of making a movie through paintings. Well, when I think about why film in particular had such a huge impact on the second half of painting in, in 20th century painting, mm -hmm. part of it thinks that when you, when I try to imagine the art history that was available or that was considered serious painting for, through the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. those were basically abstractions. Right. And film that emerges in the mid 20th century as the place where the most rigorous kind of philosophical um, interrogation of what an image is right. happens. Right. And that's why you see in the 80s and 90s this like flood of people engaging with images and painting. Yes. And their primary dialogue, people like you, people like Lisa Scavenge, people like, uh, I would say, even David Sally mm -hmm. and um, Schnabel, mm -hmm. they're, they're in conversation with film. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has something to do with like about something about the power of the image or like what it is that you wanted an image to be able to do in a painting. Right. 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 And there was a kind of like that Antonioni movie, Zabriskie Point. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw that. Yes, yeah. yeah. And it's not a perfect movie at all, but it is a fascinating movie because, and he, I think, was very self was very conscious of that there was such a dialogue with pop art and he constructs, you know he gets to la he sees everything all of a sudden as opposed to being in europe as flat and these flat you know and so here he is as a movie maker i mean obviously film always had dialogue with painting they looked at painting and you know right um so yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, so if, if, if you know, I was an abstract painter at some point, and was an expressionist painter, um, then rejected all of that later. And so where do you go? And, and, and so for me, where I went um, was, was, was that you sort of start looking at where other people, and like I was always interested in discarded material this thing that people are not looking at anymore. Um, like, I think it was Chuck Close that said, a way of being an avant-garde art, uh, artist is what you try to do is make anti-art. And you look at what is the art of your surrounding, and quite often, as in his case, or in my case, it was exactly the most sort of seemingly conventional painting is it because everybody's running away from it, right? Like I went to school in Chicago and, and there was the Harry Who tradition there was, was, was reigning really large. And so the mythology there was, oh, they stopped going to museums and they went to natural history museum. So as an art student, that's what you were supposed to do. You wouldn't go to Chicago Art Institute, you would go to natural history museum. Well, since this is your academy, you do the opposite, right? You go to the art museum. You don't go to a natural history museum anymore. That's what your elders did. So for me, it was kind of like, yeah, so you, 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 um, I started looking at what used to be taboo even for me. I started looking at European painting, sort of pre-modernist. I mean, when I was an art student, I remember I had this book, it was called Primitive and Abstract Art. So you looked at everything, bef at everything before Renaissance and then, you know, late 19th century, 20th century. Everything in between was sort of like, oh, this is just that boring <laughs> shit, you know? Stick. Right, and all of a sudden I go, oh, 
this is like a whole thing here nobody is looking at. This as far as I noticed, right? And 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 I so I thought if I just do a half baked job stabbing at it, I'm like I have a whole area, you know, free for me to maneuver, to rape and pillage there. I don't even need to be that great. It's just nobody's everybody's is fishing in the other pond. They're just I mean there's and so I, I remember I was going to the Met when I was really constructing what I was doing. And, and the Met has important stuff on the second floor, the Metropolitan Museum. And on the first floor, floor they, do, they have all this stuff that nobody knows what to do with it anymore. They know it's great. It was very accomplished. But ideologically, theoretically, we don't know how to think about it. And what and, and, and what was really fascinating to me was all these bar reliefs mm. and also wood inlays, but specifically bar reliefs. And I thought nobody makes bar reliefs anymore. Like Matisse was probably the last one, right? Well, uh, Charlie Ray just did one. But anyway, but but it's interesting that he did. Yes. Right, you know, Rachel Feinstein just did so. But but basically I was thinking, so why why and why are they relegated to the first floor where you basically see them on the way to the bathroom right or a cafe and i thought that's because we don't know how to think about them they are like i realized how still essentialist we are we like our painting to be painting we like our sculpture to be sculpture it sits somewhere between sculpture and drawing yeah mm -hmm. A sculpture which also depends on shadows and is basically drawing. Yeah. And I, I, and I got utterly fascinated by it. I actually did some bar reliefs. I have them somewhere in the studios and early, you know, I did a few of them based, you know, based on family photographs. And I was always sort of fishing in this discarded material, in this debris of this highly refined classical European culture, which now you know, the barbarians kind of smashed it up and you just kind of like, which is exactly what people did in Renaissance, right? They just go, oh, isn't that cool? Like, look at what the Romans did. And I just felt like I was a scavenger in this junkyard of, of our history that, you know, I'm not supposed to look at this stuff. No critic knows what to do with this. I wasn't explained how to think about it. So all my thoughts were my own. I was really on my own ground, just utterly free. To, like I said, play like a child with this debris of this shit, you know? Uh, so, so, so there was film, and of course, that was sort of categorized as high culture of our time, mm -hmm. and it was. And also, it was, like you said, a representational narrative, blah, blah, blah. And then there was this other stuff, which, which I could now utilize for, for, for my own purposes. And, and um, yeah. Well, I didn't realize that you ever made bar relief or like had that that part of your trajectory, but it makes total sense in the sense that this is something we can talk about with, with your paintings, but also painting in general, which is a painting has this very complicated dual reality that mm -hmm. we've often discussed, where it is a physical object and it is an image. Yes. And and those things work together and work against each other to varying degrees throughout the history of, of like making paintings. Right. And like a bar relief is such a really brilliant kind of an epitome of that. Yeah. Right? Because it's like it is a big piece of rock that has shape to it. Right. But also because of the modulation of light and shadow, it is like a painting. Yes. And that Charles Ray yeah. is just like that. Yeah. You know, there it's there's so little carving there. Right. But it is it's like palpably a picture. Yeah. 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 And so I'm wondering, like, how would you, because you obviously went to graduate school for sculpture. No, I went for painting. Oh, you went for painting. But, and then you started making sculpture at graduate school. Yes. So what is the, tr I, there's something that feels to me that I haven't ever been able to articulate properly with you about that move from abstract painting to sculpture back out to images in which the painting itself is functioning as an object as, and as an image. Sure. Right, right. Well, what happened was, so I went to school in Chicago, and I remember 
it was a very free sort of still 70s place where I could do whatever you, I mean, I studied architecture actually throughout most of my, my undergraduate, like first in Moscow, then there, but then I would paint on the side and I would do performances. I took film classes. Uh, I did do films myself, Whoa. but uh, it was kind of a Stan Brackage. Abstructuralist films. Well, they were abstract films. Just, you know, the guy I remember, everybody was trying to make narrative films and he goes like, that's so weird. You just like went directly for abstraction. And yeah, that's what was interesting to me because it was sort of an extension of the paintings and even designs that I was making. Like I was designing structures with like found object, lamps out of garbage cans and whatever. And so, so everything I was involved with was, 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 was stuff like that. And then I was looking at Rauschenberg's combines I was really ignorant of Schnabel or Kiefer or anything like that. Actually, I did not know about them, did not see them until um, I went to Europe. Or, or, or I, I thought, you know, so they sort of resembled actually Kiefer or Schnabel. And, and there were these paintings that would dissolve into um, installations and stuff like that. And they were very raw and very rough. And, 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 and. so then when I went to Yale, I tried to make what later I termed autonomous painting. I really like thought, okay, I'm at Yale and I, I, I don't know what, I guess it was kind of a conservative place and, and maybe I was just sort of thought that this was everything else I was doing was sort of fun and games. I need to sort of grow up and sort of confront painting somehow. But I really could not understand what painting was. And so originally when I started, when I tried to make quote unquote straight paintings, I think I even called them to myself, there's just straight painting. <laughs> None of that installation bullshit or light bulbs lightening up, or I made this painting of, 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 uh, of this big giant woman and, and it had a, 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 a bottle, like a beer bottle stuck in her chest. And I didn't believe in the reality of this painting until I actually cut myself on a broken bottle and then bled into paint. <laughs> So that gives you, right, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so, so the painting became real when I bled into it. Uh-huh. Okay. Years of struggle. That's right. So, um, so then I thought, all right, this is a little something or other. And, and, and let me try to make like a straight up painting. And I, and I remember, so what I thought I would do, I would reconstruct the painting from scratch by going back to the original stories. What was the stories? The biblical stories. So it, I did like Adam and Eve, prodigal son. Uh, and I thought that the form of them would find itself just me just pounding or just, 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 just going straight at the story. These paintings were so ugly and awful <laughs> that I gave it to my parents and they tried to live with them. And then they couldn't. They brought it to the basement. So they said, you know what? We can't. We don't want to look at Adam. <laughs> no, no, there was a prodigal, there was a prodigal son. It was, I guess, based on, on Rembrandt, and he's like hugging his his father's knees. So there was just, and it basically looks like he's giving him a blowjob. And and you know, and and I mean it had moments. It had moments. Uh, but so So you were sincerely trying to be as perverse as possible. I think I was honestly trying to be as true to myself and somehow truth as possible. I don't, I think perversity was beyond me. I mean, I wish I was, no. I mean, later, like now perversity is actually an important ingredient in my work. Then, no, I was just utterly, I was making these little perverse little paintings, which everybody loved because they were beautiful and, and they were like called the myth of camaraderie. And they just like basically everything Yale wanted from a, from a student, I would just put into it and they all loved it. And I just totally did not mean it. <laughs> and, and so I would do these earnest paintings and then I would do those. And, and, and so then I, I sort of realized that I had no idea. Painting to me was such an insecure object. Looking back, I realized I was the insecure object. Mm-hmm. I've been five years off the boat, so to speak, like an immigrant. I had no idea how art functions outside of an art school. What does a painting do? Socially, culturally, economically. 
And what was the problem? And I was just so insecure. So, so, so I, I dish painting and I started making these concrete objects that later, I guess, I guess they're sculptures. Mm -hmm. But there was just a direct way of making an image. So I built a dome. I made a winged ladder. I built a bed. And it was all made out of concrete. So I had all these dialogue with concrete as this man-made earth, but also extremely ancient mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And the concreteness of it, the utter sheer weight of it, would convince me in its reality. So a teacher of mine said, oh, you're still an image maker. And that was kind of true. I just dispensed with painting, and I would directly make images. So with all of your doubt and questioning of the image, and the validity of the image, and the reality of the image, what Can I interrupt you? Yeah. It was not the image. The image I trusted. It was the object. Oh. In what this case? thing. This <laughs> thing. Like, what is this thing? Where does it go after I'm done with it? What does it do in, in society? I was, I was still taught by formalists. Mm -hmm. So there was no politics involved. Like I kind of really wished what people talk about too much now was talk to me a little bit at the time. So I just, Thought, yeah, I just thought I would just make something that was so raw and, and un, that it would find its own place in the world through its sheer weight and concreteness and, and undeniable reality. And that is how you then embarked on this. I mean, because your work in a technical way, and I don't mean this as like a fetishism, I just mean it as an observation. Yeah. It's extremely rigorous and it's extremely precise. Yeah. And very many times I've like, looked at your paintings and said to you, like, no one in the world makes paintings like this. Mm. Because, because in a material sense, through this decades-long process, you've invented a way of working with the materials so that the right. image and the object are inextricable from each other. Right. The way that it looks is the inherent reality, or is the inherent product of exactly the way it's made as a thing. Right, right. So, thank, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I, what was that process like of coming back from those concrete images that we might call sculptures yeah. to returning to images like this within the paintings that are right. clearly representation? Right, right. So, so, so I was making these objects, then later they became sculptures. I even had like something in the sculpture center and I thought, well, I guess I'm a sculptor now. And then um, there were two things. I started becoming really interested in rendering. Mm -hmm. And it grew out of, because my sculptures by then were becoming more and more elaborate, in order to build them, I would just sit on my ass and make these very intricate drawings just to figure out how to construct them. The drawings evolved into its own thing. Then the sculptures only existed as a drawing. Like that was enough. So that was on one hand, I realized that I was missing a kind of delicacy and precision and, and just kind of that kind of stuff on one hand. On the other hand, I was, I remember going to the Met a lot. I remember going on Friday night once to the Met. I don't know if I ever told you the story, but, but, and on Friday night, those days, the Met was open for free. And it was full of people, mostly women, some men. They were all maybe in their 30s and 40s. And they were sitting quietly looking at these paintings. Um, I remember thinking about it. What are they looking at? And why are they here? They're not part of the art world. So what is this need that there's, okay, they're there to probably pick each other up. But okay, beyond that, right? They're obviously college educated, sophisticated people, and somehow they're looking at these paintings. And the way I realized my fiction of what they were looking at, I mean, I never asked any one of them, was that those paintings, those objects that they were looking at, basically represented back to them their own personhood. 
their own uniqueness in the world. That they were as unique in this world as those paintings. And nobody will make a painting like that. That guy is gone, or the woman. And nobody will make them exactly like they were utterly unique and specific in the world. And this is spoke to them. It was like the picturehood of the painting kind of was the, through back of them a kind of inner cavity of their own subjectivity. Subjectivity. Yeah, interiority. Right, interiority. Like and I go, oh, I understand what a painting does. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. So there, it kind of emerged out of two different strands. I was already doing something. And then I've realized the importance of painting because, at least in the West, painting spoke to autonomy and personhood. And so I said, okay, I understand the point of autonomous painting, the point of an object of autonomous painting. And what I should depict are also should be subjects of autonomy. So the subjects would be very restrictive. And, and so that fusion that you're talking about, it should really be about this, just this one thing. But here's the thing about the perception that you have of the people looking at the paintings the met. Yeah. They're not looking at them in isolation. They're looking at them in a kind of quasi-public with other people. Yes. And with the unconscious or conscious knowledge of, of the presence of others. Yes. Not just the presence of the other people in the room, but the presence of everyone else never looked at that painting. Right. The other person who made the painting. Yeah. So there is a kind of contingent, like, uh, intersubjective yeah. reality to the, the way that the painting functions in the world. Yes. That I think is, is you know, it's not just a monad between, like, the painting is an individual and the person's an individual. I think at the time I probably did see it as a monad. That was the most interesting thing to me about it. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right about that. Um, but that's where film comes in, because that's the way that film works. You have a bunch of people, right. a classical theatrical, theatrical situation, you have a bunch of people in a room all having an interior experience together. Correct. And that's the art, that's what art is. But at the time, what was important to me was that the subject and even the object of the painting, like I said, I was a sculptor and even worked as a carpenter, so I was really interested in objects and making things. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I saw and, and what I saw what a painting was and the kind of spaces then I was depicting myself, uh, whether it was a space of a family, a space of a race, or just a space of an interior, then later a church interior, that they like akin to a painting I was trying to make that they start as socially constructed, but then turn away from the social into its own interiority. So the social construction never goes away, that social contingency, yes. But at the time, what was important is this pocket of, of, of inwardness interiority. So later, I think this idea of filmic and how this idea of interdependency was, well, it was already important to me even then because I realized this is an impossible project. You cannot make an object of autonomous painting at this day and age. What you can do is depict the conditions within each painting under which that object was possible. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have all these paintings together, let's say in the space of a show or simply your studio, it becomes, creates this theatrical installation under which things are possible. You break them apart, perhaps it becomes a ridiculous object together. Mm. A bum screaming under the rain, you know, in the rain, or whatever. So, yes. So, so, so yes, I, I, I think, so this idea of autonomy, I think was always porous for me. There's something about this that I think relates the, to your growing up in the Soviet Union that I think is really, and then immigrating to America. Yeah. I think that also your shifting relationship to Kar Tarkovsky feels like it has something to do with that. And mm -hmm. I 
I would say like one of the reasons I want to bring this up is is that, like when I was a teenager, like the rural South, I like saw a Birdman movie and like changed my life. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, right, that's art. You know what right, I mean? like, right, 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 right. And I was, you know, it was not a painting. It was not an object of art. It was like a movie, right? And not even a book, but a movie, right? Yeah. There was made it because it's a sequence of images. Yeah, it's not right. a story per right. se, but it's a whole construct. Yeah. And but I was never. I watched Tarkovsky movies, but I was never like, "Wow, this is my thing." Right. And then during in the past year during the pandemic, I've just been thinking about Tarkovsky so much. Mm-hmm. Something about the interiority of it, the temporality of it, yeah. that I've been like, I've got to go back. You know, and and so maybe you know six months ago, maybe four months ago, we threw on the beginning of Solaris. I was like, right. oh, I want to watch Solaris. No one will watch it with me. Let's put it on. And right, the only right. person I know. Who so right, we right. throw it on, and then it's just like image, image, image yes. that seems to issue forth in a kind of discourse with the sequence of images that you have been working with for the past few years. Right. The kind of. Uh, uh, Romantic landscape, the water, the, mm-hmm. the water, the still life, the rain, and I thought, whoa, there's something here. right, right, right. It isn't just about you know a glib thing of like, okay, so Matt maybe wrote in the Soviet Union, whatever. Right. But, you know, but it seems like it's something that must have opened for you. Over yeah. The well, that's that's years. That, that's that's what I was trying to remember. So when did, for example, Tarkovsky become so important to me? Um, and 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 I think. Because I think when I was in Soviet Union, I was actually much more interested in Western movies. Right, that makes sense. Right, and um, European movies mostly. Um, you know, it's hard to see. I mean, it was, uh, just as you could see Picasso's but not Malevich's in the Soviet Union, you could see foreign films and not Tarkovsky. Mm-hmm. He was made for export. Um, so I think he became maybe the best of Russia for me. Um, you know, there was a joke that Soviet Jews became Russians after they immigrated because in Soviet Union there were Jews in the passport, they weren't Russian, and all of a sudden they got to the West and everybody says, well, you're Russian. They go, no, I'm a Jew. And they go, yeah, yeah, but you're Russian, right? And then you realize, well, yeah, I drink straight vodka and <laughs> teach others how to do it. You know, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's true. You know, it's, it, at least in contrast to Americans, you're a Russian. Mm-hmm. Contrast to American Jews, you, don't, you know, and they go, you know, I don't know people like you. Uh, so, um, so I think it was, it was that, I mean, it was, like I said, the best of Russia. I didn't particularly like Russian painting, still don't, uh, most of it. Uh, you know, there was okay music, some great literature. Um, but Tarkovsky was really, and, and I do think he was a unique, I mean, you can compare him to Bergman, you can compare him to others, but I think he really, constructed this whole world of his of, of 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 his own that is just utterly like 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 a cathedral mm-hmm. i mean there was a term in, amongst the slavophiles cathedralness subornness of this kind of a you know refer to populism and stuff like that but also but but i remember i interpreted subornness as cathedralness as a kind of you know, whole world here. And um, that idea of a whole world that you can make an art, you know, was, was, was just important to me. And I agree the thing about the images. Sometimes I wish they would shut up and stop talking in his movies. Just let the images speak. When he moved to the West and started moving, like making movies like, like Nostalgia, in some ways I felt it was better because they talked less. Mm-hmm. So he really moved into image making. I mean, like, um, yeah, I don't know if that's answering your question. Um, 
Well, I mean, you had said that there was a long period where whenever you started a new body of work, you would like listen to the soundtrack of Solaris. The uh, Solaris and then uh, Mirror. This mo this painting, by the way, is called Mirror. Oh wow! Because so, Mirror Mirror is a self portrait. His 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 uh, you know like the the mirror the movie sometimes translated the mirror or mirror. Uh, I prefer mirror. Um, that's essentially self-portrait, an autobiography, a fiction autobiography. And this one, it's basically my self-portrait in, reflected in that mirror. It's a painting that you see, but it's the back of my head looking into the other space. But it's, there's basically a self-portrait there. So I call it a mirror. And it's also a highly artificial and abstract version of your life. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's you in the mirror. That is a, a self-portrait painting that I made a while ago. <gasps> that's right, that's right. That you see only the top portion of it reflected in the mirror and then reflected in, in the shiny table reflecting that mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that sense, you're right because with a lot of his scenes you would see this he would pen in at something like like floating in the water and he just trusts that you even if you have a very good print of his which makes more sense but i remember seeing a really degraded print, and you go what am i looking at now yeah what is that thing floating i mean we're listening to bach which is great and something is just like floating in the dirty water and what am i looking at mm -hmm. and his trust in that moment like slowing you down to the most insignificant moment. And that moment of, ins of insignificance, yet it's amplified to back to this unique, specific moment. Like it's, it's, it's again goes back to this idea of specificity as opposed to generalness. The reason why I had such a problem with this idea that art should reflect the social is like always reminded me of that uh, Stalin's quote that one man's death is a tragedy, a million is statistics. And it's true. So the moment you, don't, you stop talking about one and start talking about groups, they become statistics. You're willing to accept a lot of things. You know, um, one of the things, when I was looking back at Tarkovsky's Sculpting in Time, one of the things he says in the beginning, and I, and I think we're probably both interested in this because to varying degrees, we've looked back at Tarkovsky's textual sources right. for different films. So I read Solaris this, over the summer, as I know right. you have. Yeah. He, he says, you know, there's basically two kinds of work that of literature that you would want to adapt into a film. And yeah. one of them is, you know, you, you have one thing that's beautifully written, it's a masterpiece, and there's no use in turning it into a film. Right. Because you can't do anything but destroy the thing that right. made it special. Right. The other thing is you have a piece of writing that has really good ideas, the way it's written is whatever, right. and you can take you can take from it what you want. Right. And so I'm wondering, because you take photographs and then you select from the photographs what becomes a painting, which mm -hmm. is extremely elaborate transformation. Right. And I feel that there must be some kind of distinction there between, okay, what is just a good photograph or an interesting photograph? Right. And what's the kind of image that merits becoming a painting? Correct. If it's so self-complete as a photograph, it would be, though I've done those, but I mean, it's, it becomes this like thing about picturesque. And, 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 and this is where perversity comes in. And then I go like, at first I go, ooh, that's just too picturesque. And then I go, why the hell not? Well, let's go, let's go there. Yeah. Like I always like to think about the vertigo of something. Like good work of art, has to have a sense of vertigo, meaning if it just went a little that way, it would be really awful. And what's that awfulness? You know what I mean? 
And right, because if you're really safe, that's not good. It has to kind of teeter on the edge of awfulness. By the way, Tarkovsky movies, I'm sure some people think it's just, are just goddamn awful and ponderous. Yeah. You know, like, like my friend John thinks that. I mean, you know, just like, like, no, it's a painting, it's not a movie. It, you know, so what he's trying to do, what he really wants to be is a painter, not, and not you know. So, so there are people that object to, strenuously to, to, to him and it's just too ponderous and, 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 um, um, and I get it. It's, 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 it, it's, but it's important that things can become easily awful. One of the things that was an important aspect about going back to painting was giving up on this idea of, of moral, high, moral and political high ground of avant-garde. Because mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union, avant-garde was forbidden. We were all taught socialist realism, which is a form of classicism. And so we all heard these stories as everybody going to school here is that, you know, the, 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 whatever, the deplorable show, whatever it was called, you know, the, uh, the, the degenerate show, and, you know, you know, that Hitler and Stalin did not like modern art, right? So therefore, it acquired this glamour, glamour and, and, and yeah, and, and I was, you know, so there's avant-garde and rear-guard. And you definitely know which side you want to be on, right? So, so at the time, I was, I was thinking, yeah, of course I want to, I want to be there. And then I, as, as I did my research, I realized how dubious those guys were, and, 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 and when they were not rejected, by the totalitarian power, like the way the futurists were not, they happily served some awful means. So I realized, no, they were rejected first. If they were not, they were happily lackeys of, there was no moral high ground. And what I rejected at the time to myself is this idea of safety. That you do some good in the world. Like you're marching toward this bright future. Even as an artist, as an artist. Like I remember talking to a friend at Yale and I said to him, I just don't understand what it means when we're both graduating. I don't understand what it means to be an artist. Like now, like in, in, in America, in, in, in New York, I mean. And he said, oh, it's very simple, Matvey. There's a march of art history and you just take your place in it. <laughs> and I was like, wow. That... <laughs> I wish I was you. I want to be you when I grow up, but I just can't. I just don't believe in that march. Sounds a bit awful to me. Uh, so I thought, wow, I'm much more ambivalent about that. And that ambivalence, by the way, always sort of was haunting me even, you know, in terms of like my relationship vis-a-vis -vis the art world. Like this idea that you just simply plug yourself in, you know. Like I always wanted to be a contrarian. I always wanted to make it kind of difficult. And part of it, I want to make it difficult for myself, so I purposely went back to these techniques, like Sumi's drawing, that I was taught in Russia, and I hated at the time. But I've realized that that's what made me, it's like, like my nose, made me me now. I was in this unique possession of these things, it was a form of self-portraiture. So I purposely went back to what I said, I'm, I'm now speaking the language of the enemy. That I can speak really well. I don't speak the language of friends well. I speak the language of the enemy well. And what I really got interested in was classicism, which was an anathema to me. And I started building everything I did, but there was a, a lot of perversity involved in that. I realized I don't want to delude myself that I am, what I'm doing is good from capital G. It might be good from small g, I'm good at it, but I'm not good. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm not Platon, whatever you want. I mean, I'm not doing God's work here. In a, I mean, it, it, it might then appeal, but it would be like more of a guilty pleasure. But we've now, I mean, you could have that conversation about taking your place in the March of Art History in 1980, even as dubious as it was at that time. 87. 87. Yeah. But now, there is no illusion of the March. 
And and so I think I don't know. I think people still think there is. Mm-hmm. It just shifted in the political sphere. I I have a question about your use. Something that happens within the image and the painting, which is over the over the past few years, you've really focused on basically a kind of landscape image, mm-hmm. a still life image of an interior, and then mm-hmm. sometimes a still life with a landscape. Right. And I was I knew that I was going to talk with you, but one of your paintings came up for me yesterday because I I'd gone to the store and I picked up like a bunch of uh, red orange gladiolas and I mm-hmm. put them in a vase on my kitchen table. Right. And it was really warm and they started to open and we were having coffee and both my partner and I were looking at them and it was as though um sorry. It's okay. Well you turn off your phone. Besides it's like stupid somebody selling you something. Spam. Spam. We were looking at these flowers and it was almost as though we could watch them open. You know, it was so mm-hmm. small. Right, right, right. They right. were still, but there was this kind of extreme presence and beauty there. Right. In the light, in the feeling. And I thought, you know, one part of me said, oh God, maybe I should try and take a photograph of this. Mm-hmm. The other part of me knew no photograph could right. ever reproduce that feeling because it's so much about time. Right. And almost like the, the um, shimmering feeling of, of time that you know is moving but also might be still. Right. And what I realized was that your paintings of still lifes kind of reproduce that tension right. in right. a way that a, a, a painting can do but that a photograph cannot do. Correct. And I wanted to talk with you about that and your, your understanding of what it is I'm, I'm describing there. Right, right, right. Well, so we were talking about time and pain. Mm-hmm. And it is related to, but not synonymous with. So depicted time and, and is related, but not synonymous to time that it takes to make a painting. So somebody said, I can't remember who, that painting is the slowest art. What I like about painting versus the movie, let's say, a book, a piece of music, that it is very generous with your time. Mm. That you don't have to, you know, it instantaneously, instantaneously reveals itself, right? You can look at it as for a second, or you can look at it for a long time. There's a kind of a generosity about it that I like. I might spend, you know, an enormous amount of time on it, and you will look at it for a second. Um, so the slowness of making it is perhaps related to the slowness of, of, of the reading of it, but I do want it to just sort of immediately come up so that you don't see it in parts, but you see it immediately as a whole image. Mm-hmm. So that there's an instantaneousness about it, but then there is time element in it at the same time. Um, and, and so, I mean, you, you, it's not necessarily means that you, oh, so the slower the painting, the longer it took you to make it. No, not really. It takes what it takes. I don't worship labor. And this idea that just because I labored on it, it's precious that way. No, not at all. If I can make them faster, I would make them faster. I'm, I'm not, yeah. Um, labor does not make value. Um, well, like, even within this painting, there's probably, like, four or five different registers of represented time within the painting at the level of the picture. Mm-hmm. And the way that those registers all become unified is through the uh, the continuity of the surface mm-hmm. where it where you've you've managed to make them all materialize as though they're on the same plane right well, I guess there, that, yeah go ahead so i guess that partly has to do with like artificial light which mm-hmm. has its own 
kind of representation of time and progression. The light coming from the window, the temporality of the still life, which you know is like sagging and dying at the very moment it's being represented. Right. And then the gesture of turning on, tur turning on or turning off the light with, by a right. figure. Turning off in this case, yeah. Turning off. Um, I mean, I think this is one of the most complicated things you've ever made. Probably. Make. Probably. And, and, and I think, which you brought it up, I think in the end, you construct a surface. Mm -hmm. Then, in the end, a painting is an object. In the end, a painting, a representational painting, is also presentational painting. Like to avoid the word abstraction, mm -hmm. but it is true. So, so in 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 the end, you know, this becomes a field painting. You just begin a to be absorbed, this has to be materially and utterly satisfying portion. Yeah. So, so for me, when I was sort of trying to construct the kind of a model of a painting, I mean, obviously Vermeer is a model who, because he brings everything to the surface and this construction of a surface, yeah. right? Uh, though, weirdly, I was not thinking about him, maybe because it's just maybe too close or he's just too perfect. Did I mean it's sort of like what Tarkovsky was talking about? Something that's so perfect, what are you going to do with it? You know, like leave it alone. Mm -hmm. So intellectually, he was not that important to me mm -hmm. when I was thinking about what kind of painting do I want to make. I mean, people very nicely have compared what I do, even you know. Uh, to him and whatever, but but or Morandi or whatever, but 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 those were the painters that I didn't know what I really I just liked them, but didn't know what I thought of it. But Casper um, David Friedrich, and then Ang, were these models of people that would make obviously representational painting, but then they had this what do you call it contiguous surface that it just it took one part away. There was just shadow of glass. Mm -hmm. There were a piece of glass. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to make as opposed to, let's say, a Delacroix painting, which is go, oh, then, you know, then kind of a shitty brown stuff over here. You know what I mean? Look here, but not here. It's, it's, yeah, so, so for me, that's tautness. I called it to myself tautness of the whole surface was really important. When I started painting in the early 90s after making objects, there was actually very little painting. It was like the last, you know, uh, ice age of painting, you know, last time painting died, you know. And, and um, the uh, ideal object of art was something that, or uh, the ideal art was something that would dissolve itself into the nexus of life. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, I want to do just the opposite of that. 